So I'm Barry Ackroyd, I'm a cinematographer and uh, the present, uh, president of the BSC. So uh, this is a great show. We're at the, uh, the BSC Expo. The place is buzzing here. The, the, the British film industry is really buzzing. It includes the American studio films coming here, but we're also making our great indie films and, and we've got dozens of great cinema, young cinematographers coming here as well as a great tradition. You know, we're surrounded by all this technology, most of which I don't even understand myself, but it's, it's the, this technology is backing up this industry uh, to the highest level. And it's, it's, you know, it feels very proud that we're part of this. All these different uh, displays and all the different equipment and different ideas, it's that that makes our film industry great, as much as the skills, the talent, the creativity, and the, and, the, and the enthusiasm. I think you just feel enthusiasm. You can feel the enthusiasm here for cinema, and that's that's the, that's if, that's all you could hope for, really. You know, my my particular view on 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 how big or small the film is is to have an attitude. Is to have an attitude that this film. You know, I, I bring my attitude to the film. If it's a studio film, I, it'll still be getting what I do. <laughs> I'm afraid that's it. You know. It, if people don't want it, that's fine because it's, uh, there are other films that I can work on. But it, you know, I'm off to America to do a film for Paramount, uh, but it's really a film for a group of, of dire uh, you know, director and for uh, and for the actors. That's where I'm working with the actors and the director. They're, we're the team. I mean, obviously, it's it's a help if you know everything technic technically. But the other thing that this show tells you is that when I don't know something, and there's plenty I don't know, I can turn around and I can, and I can ask these guys. And they, they're the most generous people in the film industry. They, they not only design and make and distribute, they, they support uh, 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 this industry, which is a phenomenal industry. They support it with everything they have, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They're always there, they'll never let you down. They'll support the, the new filmmaker with with equipment for free, they'll look after you. They, you know, you can be on the ends of the earth, and they turn up and they come and supply you with, you know, you know, something's broken, it's fixed the next day. These are the guys who really make uh, the film industry work. You know, we're just, we're just the privileged ones who get to use their fantastic equipment and make, hopefully, make great films. Going back to the cinematographers, if you're a young cinematographer, the best thing you should do is be true to yourself. And if yourself means I want to know everything technical, I want to be able to handle every piece of equipment, I want to know each menu on each camera, you know, then that's what you should be doing. But if you want to make, if you trust your own instincts and your creativity and your artistic, you know, maybe it's your humanity, which is one of the great things in cinema. You, you trust your humanity and that will work too, you know. I personally don't believe that in the way that records have not been replaced and books have not been replaced, uh, you know, film, celluloid will not be replaced. It's, it's, it has, I feel, still think has the best look, you know, and the, the purpose you have with uh, digital filmmaking, uh, the benchmark is we can make it look like film. I suppose the challenge is to keep your integrity, to be honest, is, is not to be uh, diverted into something, you know, like, you know, my ambition is to, you know, take the lowest budget, no, no visual effects, and turn that into a film that moves people. You know, it doesn't have to, move, you know, sell two hundred million dollars worth of tickets, but you know, it, just to move people is a big challenge. Yeah, find a good script, find the good directors, work with good people, enjoy the enjoy the experience. It will never end. People will always make film. It's, it's the greatest art form of the 20th century. I think that's what the Czech, the people of Czech Republic said. It, it's still the greatest art form we have. It, it, can, it can move you, it can do everything to you. It has, it has music, it plays with time and rhythm and life. And the best stories you know, the things that will always stick with you throughout your life will be stories, human stories told in a human way. What's, what's so exciting about coming to this wonderful BSC show is first of all that you meet so many old friends, people you work with over the years you might not have seen for a while, and also this is, it's got such a wonderful atmosphere here. There's a real buzz with so much equipment. I mean, I'm, 
I'm in awe of some of the lighting and the camera equipment that are available today, which I think gives today's cinematographers a lot more opportunities to express themselves. And because things are so much lighter now and the speed of the camera, the ISA, is so much higher, you've got much more flexibility and you can work faster. And it's just opening up new opportunities all the time. It seems to go on and on. There's always something new around the corner. And I think as a cinematographer, if you've got to adapt to those changes and learn how to use the new equipment, how to understand it, how to take the best of it. Because I think the, the audiences are expecting more and more on the screen, aren't they? They want more spectacular films and it's just wonderful that this show, which fills this beautiful Richard Attenborough stage, because I had the great privilege to work with Richard Attenborough on Gandhi, who's a wonderful man who made tremendous contribution to our industry. And I think that this stage is a great tribute to him. And it's good that the BSC are here, because he was a great friend of the BSC, he worked with many BSC members. And to see this place packed with the best equipment in the business, I think is good for the British industry. And I think it's marvelous that the BSC have brought it all together. It's just wonderful. I think that the DOP mustn't lose sight of the storytelling aspect because we're telling a story we are involved with the characters and the actors and we have to look after them so i think you've just got not not to be overwhelmed by it you've got you've got to understand it know how to use it um, and know what to select for whatever kind of um, film you're doing you know you have different types of equipment depending on the budget the scale of the film how many crew you've got things like that. Well, I talk to a lot of film students and they do get very involved in the technology that really I think the essence of what the cinematographer is doing is telling the story visually, telling the story in moving images. And I think you've got to understand light and human behavior, how people react to one another, how you capture whatever the story is, how you put it onto film, whether it's digital or video, it's still a story that you have to engage an audience. And you, get, you engage an audience by making it look interesting and highlighting the points that need emphasizing. And it's also to do with how you frame the picture, how you move the camera. I still prefer the look of a film, a 35 millimeter film, yes, I think it, I think it's particularly when it comes to skin tones that film uh, has a depth and it's more alive. I think even, who, doesn't matter who's photographing the film, uh, if you're using digital, for my eye, there's a certain flatness to digital. And, and, and film I, I find much more um, pleasing. I've, I've chanced upon it. I never, when I was young, never thought of being a cinematographer, certainly. Um, I was going to be a writer philosopher, um, and I had a, a fantastic um, pretensions intellectually. Um, but as part of that, I read a lot, and read and read, and I've always been interested in story and storytelling, which is why originally I wanted to become a writer. Um, but circumstance changed things, and, and suddenly I found myself not suddenly, but over time, I found myself as a cameraman um, doing news and documentaries, but not really having a great passion for being a cameraman, but having a passion for the stories I was working on, and, and a fascination and an intrigue and a curiosity about the world. And it wasn't until much later, I'd, I'd done news, I'd done documentaries for about 20 years, that I suddenly saw um, a change that instead of simply observing these stories and, and recording them, I, I wanted to be creating them and be part of that process of creating the stories. And that's when I, I, I suddenly realized that, well, actually, first off, 
I should be a cameraman because it's a fantastic way of, of going down that route of creation of stories. Um, and secondly, I had the opportunity because I had developed a certain skill level over all those years as a news and documentary cameraman. So that's what I did. I, so I made the conscious effort of changing my career and moving into drama to, to be more creative as opposed to reactive. I think it, it's, it's, there's a maturing process that, that I think we all see, particularly if, if you're involved in any teaching of, of young film school students and cinematographers. Initially, you're obsessed with the, the tools, with, um, with the, the practical process, um, with the cameras, with the lights, and, and you think that that is what you need to know about to be a cinematographer. It's only over time that you begin to realize that those tools are simply a means to an end, that it's about the story, it's about the storytelling, it's about so many other things than those technical th elements. Hopefully, though, over that period of time, you have mastered those elements so that they become transparent, so that you no longer have to think about them, that over the experience that you've gained and over the, the insights that you've been party to through watching other films, through talking with other cinematographers, through your meetings with directors, that, that you actually come to a, a, a sort of a synthesis of all the ideas of all the skills and everything that makes a cinematographer. And at that point, you begin to realize, I think, as part of your maturity, that all of those things are important to know but more important to all of it, and that something that they should all be subservient to, is to the story, and specifically the story in relation to the director's ideas. And once you, you start playing around with that, then that opens a whole other level of fascination and interest. And also, you know, hopefully, um, one, one can develop a fearlessness in regards to the technical that you don't believe, oh, I can't do that, because, you know, you just do it. And so that, again, opens things up more in terms of how you can tell stories. And, you know, hopefully the whole thing becomes, you know, a, a sort of self-fulfilling, that the more fascinated you get by stories, the more comfortable you are with the equipment, the more effectively you can tell the stories with even less equipment and simplify. I've been very fortunate. I've worked with Steve McQueen for 12 years now. And one of the beauties of Steve is that he's unencumbered by a lot of the, um, the conventional ideas associated with filmmaking. He's an artist, and as such, he doesn't feel any limitations, physical, emotional, um, practical. And so he's always asking for things that are impossible as a, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have to accept that they're not impossible and simply do them. And that has been such an amazing inspiration because you realize that a lot of these limitations that we place upon ourselves, are, you know, we place them upon ourselves through social mores, through um, the, you know, technical um, ideas. There are so many of these things that we limit ourselves with in terms of storytelling um, because a lot of filmmaking is, it is very conventional. You work with someone like Steve and you realize that you can throw all that away and start again from somewhere much simpler. And it's delving into the simplicity uh, that can be incredibly satisfying, but more than that, incredibly effective in terms of storytelling. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite simple. I'm very lucky that I am in the privileged position where I can turn work down. When I was younger, I was not in that position and would basically do any film that came along. And I would say to any budding cinematographer, do every film, even those that you think are gonna be disasters, because you will learn more on that film than probably any other film you work on. So it's, it's you know, I, almost in a way, I guess I'm becoming lazy in that I choose the films that I think are gonna be most challenging um, and sometimes most comforting or most exciting as opposed to just saying yes to anything that comes along. I mean, technology, it's a very important part of the job. You have to keep up with it. Uh, I think it's a shame that it, everyone is being told it's changing for the better. Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, no one's asked me or most of the cinematographers what they wanted. 
Um, and uh, speaking for myself, I was very happy with film. I am very happy with film. I think it's an incredibly creative medium. It's a very can be technically challenging, um, but remarkably rewarding. And now it's being taken away. To, to whose benefit is that? It's not to mine. It's not to the audience. It's not to any filmmaker. You know, the more tools we have, you know, the more chances we have to tell the story successfully. We've been blessed for this short period of time. We've had film and digital, but now film's being taken away. That, that saddens me. No, I think it. I think it's in a very perilous state. I mean, I, I mean, there are. You know, God bless Chris Nolan and Dan Mendel and. You know, people like Ian Softly are always championing it. It's quite a difficult thing to do when you, when we are doing these big films, which could, could, you know, because there, there's the argument of what film costs. And you talk to Tim Lewis and some other producers, they, they think they can save money by shooting film. But there is this idea that, that film is expensive. And um, so small budget films, or small budget features probably will not end up on film because the producers aren't experienced enough. Like some of the older producers say, it's okay, we can do this right. We can actually make a film for, you know, the same price you can make digital. One of the great things is discipline, of course. People actually know on a film set, when it's shooting film, they're much more disciplined than they are shooting digital when the camera just runs all day. And, you know, there's all sorts of other ideas. However, you know, if you're going to a big film, you know, your stock costs are less than 1% of the budget, you know. So, you know, creatively you could say to a director, uh, you know, or cameraman, let's shoot on film, and that's great. The trouble is, when you, some of these films, some of these films have um, 2,000 effect shots, or more. So, and they're the big shots, they're the big shots people remember, the big, you know, whatever, this huge landscapes or on a, on a planet or something like that. So those are coming out of the computer. They're not coming out of film. The close-ups might be. So there you are on a big budget film, and they'll say, let's shoot a film, and yet over half your shots have more than 80% of a CGI image. So we're... Why are you shooting a film, you could argue? Well, hopefully you've, got, hopefully you've got a great script, and that seems really, you know, even if you've got a good script, they seem to have self-destructed and rewritten it by the time you started it. So half the scripts I would have, probably I would never have, I would never have shot if I'd known how they ended up. Um, then you need a strong director. Hopefully you get a strong director, what director you like and a script you like. Now it seems that sometimes you don't have a script, you meet a director who's done this, that, and the other. The studio think is marvellous. Yeah, you, I get hired. In that situation, I'm not getting hired by the director. I'm getting hired by the studio. So they're relying on you. They're relying on me, uh, and they'll get a good production designer, a good editor in, a good AD, and we're seen as a sort of team. It's not. It's not the vision of one person. And I think studios studios fear the strong director. They don't want they want their script, they want their will and their ideas to be executed. So they 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 take someone who's grateful to have the gig rather than someone who says walks in the door and says, right, I don't like the script, let's start again with that. Um, and it seems more and more the thing every time you get a script now, and I see production designers wandering around here or leaves and they say, Oh my god, that script's terrible. And it's the same thing. It's, it's, it, you know, you, you're, you're still you're writing all the way through the film. So you don't know what you're making. You don't really know. You can't actually honestly say I agree to do this because you don't know what it is. Now you could always, you know you could always say that you know the film is the film at the end when the final edit is made. But I've I've seen scripts. Everything change on them. Everything. You know, they just issue a new one. They didn't even bother doing color pa color pages anymore. I do. I mean, the trouble is, the, the trouble is that, that, that you, you've got these either up here with huge budgets, or you're or you're fighting for bones under the table. You know, for you know, last year's 17 million, this year it's set 12, 11. Then you're down to 5.5. Then you're down to two million dollars. You know, less than two million. I made a film for 150 thousand know, pounds. <laughs> So with that, you know, we talk about 150, you know, 150 million, no 150. <laughs> when you're talking to young students, what do you tell them to do? How do you 
A lot of times just shoot anything and keep going. I, you know, I admire the, you know, the, 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 well, the DSLR punk rockers, as I call them, more that used to be. You know, I admire their spirit. Um, I think it's difficult. I, say, I, think, I think it's very difficult to get noticed. I think it's very difficult for the ones who can really shape and make an image to come through because basically the, the cameraman sort of become the recorder now. He records things. He doesn't actually shape or, you know, light or put, choose a lens. They pick a camera out with a zoom lens on and they run around all day. Um, they record stuff. Um, they don't actually shape and... You know, should we get forward on 75 or should we come back on a monthly five? You know, they don't, just, they don't know what those things are. They don't know what the formats are. Um, and I think the well, it's the domestic market of these cameras that are so good now that have me meant that anyone can be a filmmaker, and that's great. However, the downside of that is that they think they've got a camera with so many pixels in, and therefore they're ready to go and shoot a huge Hollywood film. Yeah, but I mean, why bother? I mean, it's all it's out of date in six months. You know, you used to buy an old Aeroflex and it would last you. You know, it's like it's like a Rolex. It would never go wrong. Really. That's why, you know, Aeroflex were making cameras that were too good. They weren't wearing out. These things, they wear out. <laughs> no, I just, I, I don't really think they're really, I mean, I don't really like, to be honest, I, don't really, I mean, I quite like the chip inside that thing. It's the ones above your head, they're okay. I like. The, I mean, they're all pretty good. You know, they're not any different. The trouble is you've got so much manipulation later. Um, but they all have the same weaknesses. Flesh tones look horrible. People look like they made a plasticine. The highlights don't hold. They don't look good underexposed. They don't... I don't believe the colours. They have trouble in achieving cyan. Cyan, do you know what cyan is? You know, no one knows. Um, you know, it's the same old problems. I don't care what they are. It's an electronic camera. You know, it's a, it's the same problems we had back when they were, you know, Sony 330s and Ikigami 79s and all those old cameras. It's still an electronic camera. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like what it does to people. So I'm not too. I don't get excited by them. No, I don't get excited by. Oh, it's got more resolution. Oh, fine. You know, we're still finishing on 2K. What's the point? You know, oh, we're shooting 3D. Oh, really? Fantastic. Want to show it in cinema where, you know, standards in cinema, when I was a DP, I had to get 16 and a half foot Lamberts on the screen, or 16 foot Lamberts. 14 was acceptable, 16. With a digital 3D projection, two and a half, totally unacceptable. I mean, you know, so, you know, Peter Jackson got 11 foot Lamberts. He had four projectors tied together. <laughs> what are you going to ask? Every cinema owned to buy four projectors. So there's all these sort of things that I haven't really, the great promise of the digital thing hasn't really come through. And I, I can't see, you know, it gets so difficult to go to 4K, to, to, to do images on 8K. Um, and it's not really, I mean, I'm more about colours and rendition and the way people look. I don't give a damn about resolution. As long as it's good enough, you know, um, I don't make films for people to watch on their iPhones. I'd much rather they went to the cinema, but I don't think the resolution's a problem. I think it's the integrity of the cameras, the colour reproduction, faces, burnt out exposures, things like that are more of an issue. Well, it's a Oh, it's a great place right now, the UK. We have a thriving studio system, and I guess what's always helped us, I think, in the UK is the amount of um, acting talent we have. Uh, two things, the English language and, and the level of theatre here uh, mean that even a small project has access to great acting talent. It certainly has access to great crews because uh, 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 there's just such an abundance of great crews here. Um, but the idea that you can make a film in a way, I mean, I'm also Greek Cypriot, so it would be very difficult to make a Greek film and have an international audience. Um, but just in the English language, you're already setting it up for uh, a much wider audience than, um, than you would, uh, you know. That, that we, we take it for granted because it's just language, but actually um, it opens up a viewing and distribution uh, uh, network that um, 
gives a lot of opportunities to young filmmakers and, and low budget filmmaking. Oh, I, yeah, I think we're actually in a very good place with film right now. Um, I guess for some people it might be frustrating. I, I've not had that frustration in terms of uh, choice of how to work as a cinematographer. I think I've been given the choice to shoot film or digital and been supported in those choices as long as it's been presented in the right way. Um, even combinations of using multi-format have not been a, a, a kind of problem. I mean, to some extent, I think doing a, a project you, you love and you couldn't do has been made possible. Um, the way technology is, uh, uh, my favorite film for many years has been Lock, and it was a real opportunity. I don't think I could have done a film like that um, if there wasn't an array of tools that, that help you do something uh, uh, like that and a choice uh, to be made. Um, and I also think that with so many different kind of opportunities of how to shoot something, again, the people behind that are the vendors. And I have to say, they're the beyond any national lottery, film funding, etc. The number one people that have to be given a, a, a big thank you to are uh, the rental companies. I've never ever felt a difference between a low budget film, my student film, or a, a studio film. Um, and they need feedback, they need, they love to support, that's in their nature. Um, and I don't know, I feel it's kind of almost wrong to complain about the way things are right now because um, it's down to your decision making and choices really. Um, we rarely get to see each other uh, uh, in the cinematog various cinematography departments. This is a great opportunity to say hello and see what people are up to. You do get insight into equipment but um, I think if you're diligent with keeping in touch um, you find out, and I think the thing with all these facilities is uh, it's an open house policy uh, uh, anyway. So uh, anything you see here that you get a look at, you could call up and, and go and have a look. I think for us here in the UK, there's a lot of uh, uh, foreign producers of film equipment that we don't get to see that often. So that's always, those are the places I like to go uh, first off. Well, I think the, the whole point of being here is to just get some insight into what's available uh, uh, for us to, to use as cinematographers and further our craft. And anything uh, we can do to improve the way we tell stories is going to be a positive thing.